All right. Uh, so, poem. There are quite many people behind this, many different organizations. Uh, so, but it, it, it's in Strasbourg that we develop the core of the thing, and then there are some add-ons that come from different universities and different different teams. Um, first of all, so let's talk a bit about MOOCs. But um, let me talk that most of you know about MOOCs, I would say. Or should, is it necessary for me to come back on a few uh, few things? No, yes, no. Uh, so the idea is to make uh, uh, available high-level courses for free, open uh, for free with open registration. And right now, I would say that there are two types of MOOCs. There are academic MOOCs, uh, um, and typically uh, the idea would be uh, that you have uh, open educational resources. And uh, this dates back to last year, but things are moving very, very quickly. And so last, in, in, in 2013, we had Udacity. Uh, they had been doing the first course on AI, so 160,000 students, um, on which, of which 23 uh, completed the course, which was a real, real surprise for them, because they thought that maybe they would have a couple of uh, thousand uh, uh, people who would enlist, and 160,000 was huge. I know, and then they said, okay, but nobody is going to, to complete it, but 23,000 did complete it, so that was another big surprise. When you get 23,000 uh, 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 things to evaluate, then your bid's taken aback. <laughs> so typically when you're thinking about creating MOOCs, you have to, if your MOOC is, uh, um, is becoming uh, uh, fashionable or whatsoever, uh, then you could be facing this kind of, of numbers. So you must aim... I think that a good way to, is to aim a MOOC at 100,000 people uh, with 10,000 people completing it. You know, that would be a, a good aim. Uh, then you had EDX, uh, that was HALA plus MIT in Berkeley. So all the big major universities are going into MOOCs. All right. um, and then, of course, there are profit companies, uh, profit companies among which you had the uh, so Khan Academy, Peer2P University, Udemy. Uh, and, and in 2013, so there were 3 million learners in, enlisted in MOOCs. Uh, and in France, they developed rapidly, of course. Uh, so the, the, the first MOOC it was in December 2012. And of course, many MOOCs uh, uh, have started, well, not that many have started in 2013. They all, most of all, uh, are starting right now in 2014. Okay. And so in 2014, uh, the French government has said that it was a national priority and somehow so they, they created FUN, FUN means France Université Numérique uh, and uh, uh, so FUN is the platform and all the, all the videos are going to be hosted by Dailymotion so it's Dailymotion that hosts all the videos of uh, French MOOCs they're hosting it for free so you can have free access to it but of course if you want to to go through a pedagog uh, pedagogic curriculum, you have to enlist through Fran France Université Numérique, and there you will be uh, given the sequence. Because there are two types of MOOCs. Uh, the two types of MOOCs that you have uh, are oops, X MOOCs, X MOOC and C MOOC. And the C is in here. Um, so maybe the X MOOC is with reference to EDX, which is one of the. Uh, um, most well-known platform, and, based, and by the way, FUN, France Université Numérique, is based on open EDX. All right. Now, the thing with, with EDX it, is that the platform is open, but the contents are, 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 are not free. They are not open in EDX. Okay? Uh, Why with Coursera, it is the opposite. The platform is, is not open source, is not available, but the contents are open. So, you see, different, you have different policies with uh, different... Uh, um, institutions. <coughs> so, uh, with XMOOCs, XMOOCs are open to students who can go and, and, and do all the courses they want, but they somehow mimic traditional teaching and uh, they, ha they have closed contents. That is, um, uh, it is exactly as if I was giving a course in university, so we have somehow some kind of classroom and the teacher uh, gives the first course, then the second one, then third one, then the fourth one in, 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 uh, in a series like this. And people enlist for the course. It starts on a certain date. 
then there are periodical evaluations on a certain day too, and then it finishes on a certain date, so it is all very uh, uh, academic in, in, in its way. Um, yeah, the teacher delivers his course, fixed interval of time and everything. And then you've got CMOOCs, and CMOOCs are connectedist MOOCs where, which, where um, people come up with um, some small courses on how to do a derivative, on how to do something. So this would, would be more uh, along the lines of uh, Khan Academy, where you can do, just do something and, 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 uh, and have your small course uh, displayed by uh, Khan Academy. And the problem you have here, so this is very participative, but both uh, paradigms have their problems. So the problem with, with X MOOCs is how can one teacher, or even a pedagogic team, correctly evaluate 10,000 students who will finish the MOOC, all right, because it's a, it's a curriculum, and then how do you, can you expect 100,000 people to be able to go at the same pace, at the same rhythm, uh, some of them will be slower, some of them will be fast, quicker, because they have different knowledge, different, they have a different background. So some, for some of them it will be really boring. For some, for some others it will be too difficult to follow. We can't have 100,000 people following the same course at the same speed. That's, you know, it doesn't make sense. And for CMOOCs, how do you deal with new contents? How can you um, evaluate uh, just a course on one thing and, and not on a whole curriculum? So the two are different ways of seeing the same thing. But uh, both types of MOOCs have their problems. Okay, and so here is where uh, complex systems appear, uh, because on poems we are going to use complex systems in order to teach complex systems, but we can also teach something else. We are not bound to teach in complex systems. Okay. Uh, so one of the definitions you could have a very wide and, and, uh, and uh, um, general definition of complex systems would be to have a large number of heterogeneous, possibly heterogeneous entities in interaction with, there's a small bit missing here, with an emergent behavior. It's important that only know all, all the different uh, um, entities, when they collaborate together, create something that is more than the sum of the parts. That is uh, the famous sentence from Aristotle. All right. um, yeah, Aristotle proposed that. The whole is more than the sum of the parts. And it's well adapted to the autonomy of, co of collective behavior, and of course you can, you have all seen this, all right? Um, well, you will not see this. Ah, what is this? I don't even have any mouses. Okay, I hope I can get out of this. Yes, well, they will escape. Hmm. I hope I'm going to have them. So, the, 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 that's just to show. Well, that's not happening. That even crowds, of course, have the same uh, uh, collective behavior as fish or as cool of, uh, uh, or, or as uh, birds, you know. And of course, you have ants, all right? And ants uh, show a collective behavior. We'll come back on ants later on through stigmatic communication. That is, it's not communication between different ants, it's different from bees. Bees, they communicate directly when a, when a bee has found a, a large field of flowers, then when it comes back, you know, there's a bee dance, and the bee's dancing in front of the others, indicating at which angle towards the sun it is, then the frequency of the dance tells at which distance it is from the sun, then they, they really communicate one to, it's one, one to N communication with the, the bees that are facing the ants that is dance, the, the bee that is dancing. With the ants, it's different. With the ants, they are leaving information on the ground, um, as you're using pheromones, so it's called stigmatic communication. It's not direct communication. Okay, and uh, so that's basically uh, what there is about complex systems, and you will see how it will come in. So now, <clears throat> let's have a look at how education evolved a long time. Um, a very long time ago, you had private tutors. And private tutors, I'm talking of several centuries ago, before school existed. So you had some very rich families who could afford having a scientist, who could afford having a some guy, very bright guy, who was doing his research, probably, and he needed to be paid to do his research. So one way of getting paid was to give courses to um, a couple of children. And so you had this very bright guy 
uh, who would have two or three children to take care of. And, and of course, um, he would know the children very well, and this would be really personalized education, because if one of the, of the children uh, showed that he was good as, at arts, so the, 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 the tutor would develop the artistic uh, skills of, of this child, and another one was, uh, was good in science, so uh, the, preceptor, the tutor would, would develop the scientific side of this, of this child. And so it was very uh, uh, dedicated education, and different education for each child. Okay? And the tutor uses his experience and to predict the aptitude. So he sees that this, this child has an aptitude towards one domain or another. And so with his experience, then he can do some, uh, um, he can yeah, develop the skill of the child towards one direction or the other. So that's predictive education. But of course, that was very costly, so available to very few people. And then, what was the solution to that, so that everybody could read, write, and, uh, and count? That was school and education for all. But here, you cannot have one teacher for three or four children. That would be much too expensive. So, in France, at least, you have typically, what well, this is what it has evolved to right now. You have around 30 children per class. Okay, and, um, but, but at university, you can have possibly more than 100 uh, students per course. And in, in medicine, typically, you have, um, in first year, you could have 600, 700, 1,000 students following one course. And the way you're doing this is that you have uh, uh, one theater where there's the, the, the professor who is giving his course. And then you have two or three theaters where the course is replicated by video. So right now, if you're not quick enough in the morning, if you're not getting there uh, half an hour, three quarters of an hour in advance to get a seat, in the theatre where the, the professor will be, then you have access only to another theatre where you only see the video. So it's not very interactive. And this is how it's done right now. Uh, <clears throat> and then, of course, you have to have a national curriculum so that everyone uh, is graded the same way. Um, and as a result, you've got a large number of students who can read, write, and count. But the problem is that there are leftovers. So there are students, as I said, who are slower, and there are students who are faster, and you cannot take care of it. And with MOOCs, it's even worse, because you can have, it's not 30 pupils that you have in one class, but you can have 100,000 students for one, one single class. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so this is where uh, uh, what we're doing comes in. So um, the idea is to create a learning uh, management system uh, that is based on a robust complex system. Okay. And the idea is to implement four, what we call 4P education, because there is 4P medicine, 4P health. 4P health is uh, participative health, uh, predictive health, preventive health, and then personalized health. Uh, why am I talking about health? Because it, 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 it's really a parallel uh, thing. Um, uh, you may have heard that last year, Angelina Jolie had uh, both breasts removed uh, because um, uh, her genetic uh, uh, well, inheritance showed with a long, so let's say that participative health showed that people who had this very gene, this, ver this version of a gene, you know, along with, I don't know, uh, such parentage, would develop a uh, breast cancer with a certain probability. And with her, it was predicted, so through participative health, many people who who share the data, then you, then you see that uh, people who develop breast cancer may have some common, common uh, things, things in common. And when you see someone new who is having this, uh, these traits that, have, that all the other ones had, then maybe you can predict with a probability that uh, this person will develop the breast cancer. So that was predicted to Angelina Jolie. I think it was predicted with 80% chances. So rather than having breast cancer, then she went into preventive health, and preventive health consisted in having her breasts removed, so as to prevent the appearance of, of, of cancer. Okay? Um, and here we can do exactly the same with education. The idea is, to, is through participative education, so participative education can be inter-tutoring, -tutor so you can have tutors between students, 
one, one student who is two years in advance of another student can be his tutor. All right? And for a student, explaining things to someone else is also very uh, rewarding. It's, it's something that is very pedagogic to, to teach because you will, you will have to understand yourself things that you may not have thought about uh, to answer questions of the other student. All right? uh, then it's important to be able to improve contents that you should be offered to add some new things so that everything is not fixed. Um, then you, are all, you have also to be involved into peer-to-peer -peer evaluation and all this um, also allows to analyze the good trajectories and wrong trajectories leading to success or leading to failure. So this is the whole, everything that is contained to the part, into participative, participative education. Once you have this participative education, the mass of the people will allow you to find some good trajectories. The good trajectories will allow you to, to do some predictions because if someone is following one of the trajectories that you have seen that 10,000 other people have followed, then probably this person will be interested in what the 10,000 10, others have been interested, to, interested in. So you can do as well as the tutor of the old times who saw that someone had some affinities with the domain now, if you see that someone is following the, the trajectory, uh, a, tra a good trajectory that has been followed by 10,000 people before him, then maybe you can say, okay, you can suggest some new courses, say, maybe you will like this, because, well, because you know that all the others who have been doing this have been, have been liking this in the future. So you can start doing predictive education. Um, and then, um, once you have done predictive education, you see that someone is following this path, you're offering new, new contents along this path, you can do preventive education. What would be preventive education? It's very important to prevent failure. There's nothing worse than a student who is, who is stopping his curriculum because he, he says that uh, uh, the content is not adapted to what I want to do, and, uh, and then he resigns. So we should do whatever we can to avoid res resignment. And in order to avoid resignment, well, maybe we could detect that the choice of a student may not be adapted. If you have a student who has been doing a curriculum on, I don't know, uh, um, the history of uh, uh, arts in, uh, uh, in Anglo-Saxon time, okay, and so this guy has been doing this, this curriculum, and just at the moment he wants to do a, uh, 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 an item in uh, high energy physics. So, even though it is a system, the system will see that everything that the guy has been doing has been along the trajectory of uh, uh, ancient languages or ancient arts, okay? And then suddenly he wants to jump to high energy physics. There's no link in the system that, go, that is successful that goes from ancient arts, okay, to uh, uh, theoretical physics. So what you can tell him is that maybe this is an error. Are you really sure you want to be doing this? Because up to now, the participative... Uh, um, um, uh, analysis shows that nobody has succeeded to, f to go from what you've been doing to this next uh, item. Now, if so, so here the idea is to prevent failure. And if the student really says, no, that is the new trend I want, uh, I want to follow, that's my new topic in life, then maybe what you could do is to find the shortest path between what he has already done in his curriculum towards high energy physics. Uh, because maybe in high energy phys in, in students who are doing high energy physics, they need to learn English, for instance. Um, and but maybe this this guy, in, when he's doing his history of art, has also learned English. So maybe you can bypass some English courses, or maybe you can reuse things that he has done in in the past, and and try to find the shortest way between what uh, uh, all the things he has already completed towards his new aim. And that so. Uh, that would be preventive, uh, uh, preventive education. And the idea, finally, is to offer personalized education so that not everyone has the same curriculum, but that depending on, on the experience, depending on the knowledge of everyone, you, some people can go faster than the others, some people can go slower than the others, some people can all can take different directions. So that is what we, we think should, that should be done. And of course, we should always try to involve people. And here the big quote is by uh, Benjamin Franklin. Uh, Tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. 
So the idea is to put in whatever, all the steps that we are taking, try to involve people, make them participate, so that they, uh, they improve themselves much faster. Okay, <clears throat> finding optimal trajectories. There is someone here at uh, uh, VUB who, is, who has done a major paper out of uh, an experiment from Jean-Louis de Neubourg. His name is uh, um, Bernard Mandrick. I don't know if some of you know him. Mm -hmm. And in 1986, Bernard Mandrick made a seminal paper, very important, on the behavior of ants and how you could uh, translate the behavior of ants into computers. Uh, and uh, so this has later on been used by Marco Dorigo to do uh, ant colony optimization. But if you don't want to, you, to do ant colony optimization for the TSP, for traveling safety problem, uh, the idea is that maybe you can use the ant paradigm that has been completely understood and described using uh, uh, partial derivative equations. So the, at the end of the paper by Mendry, it's a 1988 paper, great paper, wonderful paper. There's everything that allows you to re-implement an ant hill. Okay? And what is nice with ants is that, I hope this is going to be working this time, yes. Uh, suppose, so this is a real, sorry, it starts with a real experiment that is here, where you have an ant, an ant hill in this, uh, uh, well, I don't know, in a, in a tray there, and here you have a source of food, and you have this strange bridge in between the source of food and, and, the, and the ant hill. And then you see that, of course, when you come back after a couple of hours or maybe a couple of minutes, uh, you will see a trail of ants that go from the, um, um, the ant hill to the food source. But this trail of ants is very special. And if you look at the ants, where are they? They are on, on the shortest trail. So the ants have managed to find which of the routes was the shortest. And they can do this not only in two dimensions, because this is a two dimensions uh, um, example to be very uh, uh, obvious, but they do it in three dimensions. So if I put a, an ant hill in a, in a tray here, if I put a bit of apple on the ceiling, if I come back several hours later, uh, you will have a trail of ants going from this to the ceiling, and the trail of ants, they will have found which is the shortest path in three dimensions. Which is, so you know, they need to know, should, is, this, is this the shortest path? Which, which leg of the table they should use to go down there, and, and where they should avoid all obstacles and everything. And, um, but if you take each ant individually, individually it's, each ant is not intelligent. It doesn't have enough neurons to do it. The way they do it, they do it is through stigmagy, through this complex system that they, that they implement. They, they use, well, ants are, have been around for 100 million years, so it is a strategy they have developed for a very long time. So it's very efficient, it's working all the time. It's, you know, and this is why there's, the ants are doing very well. You know that in, if you look at the global mass of ants on Earth, um, it's roughly equivalent to the mass of humans on Earth. Uh, but then, of course, there are many, many more ants than there are humans, because to make that uh, in kilos uh, in, in humans and in ants, you have many, many more ants. Okay. And so, thanks to uh, the equations of, uh, thanks to Jean-Louis de Neubourg, mm -hmm. it's not far from here, too, I think it's, but here's the other one, the other side. The other side. Okay, and Bernard Mandry, who has put this into equations, he's done the mathematical model. Then we can do exactly the same thing. What we observe here, well, <laughs> so this is a small applet. Okay, this one is recorded, but I have got it, so I can do it in uh, real time with you. That's the nest, that's the food source, and this is uh, what you see in yellow, is the pheromones that will evaporate in time. So, to start with, they have the choice of going either left or right, but then conceptually, you understand that if you go between H and E, if you're going through G or if you're, if you're going through F, then of course um, the, the, the smell will be much more concentrated into a shorter path than into a longer path. And then um, um, uh, what happens is that uh, when the, old, the ants have the choice to go in one direction or the other when they come back from the food source, what happens is that they will go towards the, the path that, it, that smells most. And so it, is, it has to be the, the, the shortest one. And then as they are reusing the shortest one, they are reinforcing the shortest one because it is shortest. So uh, there are more ants that can go through this same path 
in during the same um, duration, same length of time. So then you can play with them. That is what was the uh, shortest path to make it longer. So of course at first they always go on the long path because uh, it's here that the pheromones are. But then once in a while some ants make a mistake. It's very important that the, that the process be stochastic. If you don't have any mistakes, you don't have any uh, adaptation there. And by doing a mistake, then an ant will leave a trail of pheromone there because it is the shortest path. It will have the same smell as a, uh, as a trail of pheromone that will be left there. Okay, so it is efficient and it is working. Now, the question is that how can we use this for education? Um, well, uh, the, idea, the idea behind the poem is to deconstruct courses. Where you have courses that are, let's say, so in, in France we have education units, okay, uh, that are six European credits. So we're in Europe, so you should know about ECTS 2, I would say. So in, in one ECTS is around 10 hours, um, uh, 10, hour, 10 hours in presential, that is through a, a teacher. We give 10 hours there. And so if you've got a big uh, unit with six ECTS, it will have 60 hours. And what the teacher will do, he will have a chat. Chapter one, okay, and it will, he would start chapter one with recalls, then probably with a course, then with exercises, then with a bit of practice, and once chapter one is finished, he'll do the same with chapter two, chapter three, and it will, or it will be all linear. And if you want to have this curriculum and give this to a student, then the student will all have to follow the very same curriculum, but each to his speed, each to his pace. And you cannot have this personalized education, because they, that is the way it should be. So the idea behind uh, poems is to, to deconstruct the courses, and rather than having all this linear course, you just decompose this into uh, videos of 15 to 20 minutes, all right? And if you just, uh, well, so if you say that there are three videos per hour, uh, 60 CTS will make 180 roughly videos, and some videos will be recalled, some videos will be courses, some will be practice, some will be exercises and everything. And then you've got... Uh, this uh, that is totally haphazard, uh, random and haphazard, okay, so a uh, complete mess. Then, of course, that is for one UE, okay, one unit, but if you're looking on one year, so we were talking about 1,800 videos, small courses, or pedagogic items. And what are you doing with this? The idea, then, is that rather than being faced with a mess of 1,800 small courses to do, well, you can set up an AND system on this. And when you set up an AND system, what will happen is that you will have students, okay, who will go from topic A, okay, to topic C, and on topic C, then, uh, there are different uh, um, edges that will lead to different other topics, and on these edges, what do you have? you have some pheromones, uh, red ones are um, failure pheromones, green ones are success pheromones, all right? And so the, you will present the different uh, new courses to the student according to the probability they will have to succeed, depending on what they have done before. And here the, our re reinforcement uh, um, strategy is to reinforce not only on the previous edge because we want we want trajectory, so we reinforce on the three previous edges, at, uh, so that there is a link, there is a semantic link, and the reinforcement. Can we give the same reinforcement no. to the edges? No, it should be shown. Oh no, it's not shown there. It's shown in the other side. So it is. Uh, I can't remember. One half, then one third, and then one fifth, and then one sixth. Well, it makes one, uh, but we, we we decrease the rewarding with the distance. Okay, because it is more probable than the previous course has more influence than the course that was given three times, uh, three uh, courses before. Yeah? Is that an elaboration on the rate of... Uh, yes, to be tuned, of course, uh, to, to be depending on the frequency uh, that the uh, things are uh, visited or not. And, and so, um, uh, all this implementation of uh, a man, uh, a, um, uh, an anthill protocol on courses is not going to work because the, the way ants work is different than the way students work. Uh, because ants, they, it's not a problem for them to go several times in the same place. But for students, if you just offer them to, 
to, to do the same course two or three times in a row, they would say, oh, this, this system is broken because I've just done it, and why do you ask me to do it again? Well, in probability, the probability should exist that the same course be proposed several times, you know, why not? Uh, but this will be seen as, as, as a broken system by, by, by a human. Um, then, um, so this system was implemented uh, in a company uh, which was called uh, uh, Paris School, and it was a, uh, a commercial company. When, when, when they contacted us, me in 2000, uh, they had 50,000 students and they couldn't cope with them anymore. So I offered to deconstruct their courses to just explode everything. And so they were a bit uh, scared at first because that was what the company was making its life on. So we just started a very small chapter, a very small uh, part of their whole uh, curriculum. And, um, <clears throat> but then, and then they, they, we extended the system to their whole range of courses. Uh, but what happened is that because this was given to French students following a French curriculum, uh, let's say that in, uh, uh, I don't know, in eighth grade, or if, uh, you have the same course at the same time everywhere in France. So in November, this, this course would be, uh, you would see um, uh, optimal paths that would emerge everywhere, that would link the different courses together, different exercises together, to maximize uh, uh, success, all right? But then, after November, no student would roam into the same area again, and in December and in January, we would see all the rates evaporate, and in January, we had lost all the nice uh, trails that had emerged before. So that was really a problem. So we had to change the paradigm. And so the paradigm we came up, up with is the Manhill paradigm. Okay, and there was a PhD uh, a thesis that was done on this, plus quite any papers that were, that were published. Um, and, and so there are quite many differences between the Anthill paradigm and Manhill paradigm, where pheromones evaporate temporarily with ants, uh, with humans, um, we, we have uh, pheromones that erode. They erode as uh, courses are being visited. For instance, um, rather than having pheromones evaporate at a constant rate in time, if I can find my mouse, but I have no mouse. Ah, my mouse is there. Oops. Yeah. Uh, so when you're here, if you're uh, going f if you, you have just visited this course and then let's say you're going to go on course G. When you're traveling along this edge, then all the edges that are going out of the course C will be depleted in pheromones. But only the, the edges going out from B will not be depleted because B has not been used. This, uh, oh sorry, no, H has not been used or E has not been used. This is to prevent the, the number of pheromones to decrease with time if parts of the graphs are, are not visited because it's not time to visit them so you have no students there otherwise all the parts would disappear okay um, then we had also some teacher weight teacher weight means um, uh, we have some other kind of pheromone that are multiplicative pheromones multiplicative pheromones are, are pheromones that multiply that are add a factor uh, weight it's a, it's, it, it will be a weighted sum of pheromones there and uh, the weight of a teacher, if a teacher says, okay, please do this, all right, so it will multiply by 10 uh, the uh, amount of uh, additive pheromones that you had on this link. And then uh, you also have some personal pheromones, and the idea of these personal pheromones is that whenever someone visits a course, um, all the, the arcs leading to this course, for you only, Will be, will be decreased by a factor 10. So that the next time you have the possibility to go through a course that you have already, been, that you have already done, then you're not, uh, the system will not propose it to you because the number of pheromones, even though it could have been great, will be divided by 10. So you will, you will be uh, probably headed towards another, uh, uh, another course. Uh, but this also is because you have just done it. But then... Of, um, as time is passing by, you are going to forget things because these, this is about knowledge. So what is nice with these uh, 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 his, history pheromones and the, the personal pheromones there is that what we do is that we have them evaporate with time this time and not with erosion uh, because uh, the memory of people is eroding with time, is evaporating with time. So maybe one year later, 
uh, it, it makes sense to propose the, the same uh, exercise to someone because he will have forgotten about it. So we have, there is um, 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 a memory curve and you know that uh, your memory will dissipate with time and so what we implemented the memory curve into uh, the uh, personal pheromone so that uh, the pheromone would evaporate. So because it is a multiplicative pheromone, it evaporates towards one. It doesn't evaporate towards zero because one is the uh, uh, neutral element for multiplication. Okay, so it is multiplicative pheromones. Something like that. And so we have many uh, small differences between uh, the anthill system and the manthill system. So this is why uh, it's, it's a different it behaves differently. And it's nice because it allows you to tune it and to, to, um, uh, to this is what allows for personalized education. Because otherwise, everyone would follow the same path, like, 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 the, uh, like the ants. Unless someone, of course, wants to do something else, so this is nice for exploration. It's important that even though some people are suggested to do something, some, other, some people do something else, because this is how you can find new, interesting paths. Okay? Uh, so we, we rely on the diversity of humans and their uh, desire to, to explore to find some new paths. So this is why diversity among humans is very important there. Uh, but then we can also tune the system so that uh, different people have a different view of the system depending on their history, depending on what their teacher wants to do and everything. So, uh, now of course, wh why we could be doing this on one topic on, on complex systems, or let's say one topic in mathematics, we can do it towards all topics of science. And the idea uh, would be that if you, if you, do, if you have small courses in, in all topics, then you would see some paths that would emerge towards uh, economy, towards literature, towards, I don't know, computer science, towards biology and everything. And all this, they would uh, create some kind of collective uh, intelligence on, on the, 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 the optimal, because what the ants are doing, they are finding optimal paths. So you know that all the paths that are being evolved here, they are optimal. They, they will maximize the rate of learning, which is something that is great. Okay? And so, of course, you can show that this is working also with uh, several food sources. And so supposing you have uh, one of the nests that is here in the middle, if I can find my no mouse, Where's my mouse, no mouse. Okay, the nest is in the middle, so we've got uh, three other objectives. Okay, food one, food two, and food three. And then, they, of course, they find quite easily the, the shortest path, and then you can, of course, do the same trick. Make this, this path that was the uh, smallest one suddenly the way this would be done is that suddenly someone creates a new course that makes that that is more efficient. So the previous course is less efficient than the new course. And after a while, of course, uh, the the, uh, the ants will find a new path that, that will be better than the old path. Okay, and this one is emerging there. <coughs> and quite quickly, they will find a new path that is uh, that is shorter than the other one. All right. Okay. Uh, so, then there is also the problem of evaluation, and of, um, because when you have 100,000 students, how can you interact with a, with a pedagogic team? You just simply cannot. Uh, there are just too many, too many students. So what we have, we have a quite evolved uh, um, evaluation uh, scheme uh, through three evaluation steps. So the first step when a student has viewed a video, is we ask him to answer to three questions, and not only answer to three questions, but we ask him also to evaluate the quality of the three questions he's been asked. Is it a nice question? Is it an interesting question? Or is it a bad question? We, we, ask, we ask to rate it with a, a grading system from zero to five, okay? So once he has answered, and once he has evaluated the quality of three questions, uh, then we are asking him to be involved, uh, to participate, by saying, okay, now, now that you have seen the course, you've answered the questions, you know, it is somehow some kind of passive evaluation, now can you please create a new question? And to create a new question, it means that you must have understood what was going on in the course. If you didn't understand what was going on, how are you going to, to ask a question on this? So please, create a new question, okay, and then 
the quality of the question that you created will also serve to evaluate you because we have means to know if you created a, a, an, an interesting question or not. I will come back to this later. Are yeah. these multiple choice questions or open questions? It can be any. Well, for when you want to create, no, no, that's the big thing. Um, uh, the three questions here can be multiple choice questions, okay, if they've been created by, by, by the team. But when, uh, the, the big idea behind having students ask them questions is to be able to deal with open questions. So even though we can do with uh, multiple choice questions, that's it. the idea is to be able to deal with open choice questions. Because I had a, a small experience, I gave my students a task to develop a number of multiple choice questions about the goals. Yeah. And I noticed that the quality of the questions was not very good because it's not easy to make multiple choice questions because a multiple choice question should not only have one right answer, but let's say three answers that could be right but are not right. And exactly. <coughs> then you sometimes get ambiguous answers and uh, it's difficult to make a good multiple choice yeah. question. No, this is, this is directed towards open questions. Okay? And so this is why we have this complex evaluate, evaluation scheme because we want it to be open. So, um, create a new question that can be open and pr provide its answer. That's the second phase. And third phase, because here we, we had to answer three questions, then who is going to evaluate the quality of our answers? Uh, typically, we cannot ask the teachers because, as, a, as I said, a pedagogical team cannot interact with 100,000 students. It's not possible that, that some teacher answers the, uh, evaluates the question. So we have to do some peer-to-peer evaluation. And peer-to-peer -peer evaluation, well, this is something that we know very well about in research. How are, how are we doing peer-to-peer -peer evaluation in research? When there's a new algorithm someone comes up with, we are supposed to be all at, at the same level. There's no one who is supposed to be better than everyone else who is going to evaluate your new paper. Uh, so the consensus may be not good, maybe, well, what, what is used currently in research is whenever you submit a paper, typically uh, the, re the, the journal or the conference will give your paper to evaluate, to be evaluated by, let's say, around three reviewers. Okay, and depending on the evaluation of three reviewers, your paper will be accepted or not. This is how it's done. Uh, so if it's good enough for research, maybe you could think it's good enough for students too. Uh, and so the idea is that whenever you answer a question, your answer will be given to evaluate by three evaluators, three students who are at the same level as you, okay? So it will be peer-to-peer -peer evaluation as we are doing with research. And because by ans answering three questions here, you're requesting for nine evaluations of your answers. And because here you created nine pos potential evaluations of answers, then so that the system is, uh, holds itself, the third step is for yourself to evaluate nine other answers that have, that have been made by other students. And because here you created the need for nine evaluations, by participating and evaluating yourself nine evaluations, the whole thing is balanced. And all in all, uh, you will not have more uh, questions to evaluate than people who will evaluate them. All in all, the whole the thing will, will hold itself. <coughs> um, then here, what's interesting is that we're using uh, recaptchas. So you might have heard about captchas. CAPTCHAs is when, typically, when you go on a uh, website uh, and you want to register to a forum of some kind, so as to make sure that you're human and not a computer, not a bot, um, you're being asked along with your name, okay, can you please uh, decipher this twisted number or twisted uh, 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 chain of characters, okay? And um, if you answer correctly, then Mm, the computer assumes that then you're a human, so uh, they validate your, uh, your forum thing. But then uh, Google came up with something more intelligent. Let's say they used uh, a paper that was published in, I think it was in, in, in Science, I think, a science paper about recaptures. And recaptures are really neat. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have um, internet right now, or I, maybe I could. But if you go on the Google website and you want to create a new account, you will see that you, you don't have to, to, to decipher correctly one word, you have to decipher correctly two words. And the two words are quite different in nature. One of the words here is the standard twisted letters that have been generated. So you generate a, a word, okay, and then you twist it, and please can you recognize this one. But the other one is not one of these things. 
And uh, Google had this uh, great project of scanning all the, all the books that were in public domain in the world, and so they made this uh, huge library. Because they wanted to make uh, open the contents, and so that the books could be addressed by content. So they scan it, they scan all the books, and once they are scanned, they put, they put an optical character recognition software on it, and translate it into some uh, digital contents, so that you can then do some queries on the books that have been scanned. But of course, uh, optical character recognition is not uh, safe at 100%. And there are still words that OCR cannot recognize correctly because the word has not been printed, because there has been, I don't know, blot of, of ink or, I don't know, something that just prevents the OCR from recognizing the word correctly. So what Google did on these words that are not being recognized by OCR is that, well, they just ask you to do it for them. And next to the first word, that was a word generated artificially, then they asked you a word that their OCR... Uh, uh, software could not recognize. And by writing down the two words, well, the second word, you're helping them but with using your human brain to decipher what the uh, optical character recognition thing couldn't do. Yeah? So they do the same word with several people? Yes, they do the same word with several words. people. Yeah. And, and typically, if you, if you get the first word right, then you will pass. And the second one only serves for them. And so if you, if, you, if you can try it out, if you do anything else for the second word, if you, will, you will pass. And, and what they do in, in the end, they will say, okay, if it's a word that is really difficult to recognize, then they will rely on probabilities. They say, okay, 80% of the people who have been shown this word say it is from. So if 80% said from, then we're going to say it's from. And they, they put the word from in their book. That was the thing that was missing. But that's not for you to get in. It's for you to help them. Okay? <coughs> So this is about recaptchas, and so we thought that the, the idea is quite interesting. So what about using it, using it for uh, these? And among the three questions that are here, uh, of course you have understood that uh, in the three questions, two questions are questions that come from a database of questions that have been validated by the pedagogical team. They are real questions asked by the tutors, by the, by the teachers. And the third question, of course you don't know which because it's going to be a mangle, the third question comes from a student. Yeah? Uh, how does it work when the first questions can be multiple choice and the other questions are open? Well, then the first is multiple choice and the other are open, so what? Ah, okay, so you can see that there's one multiple choice and two open, something like that. Yeah. So does it mean that the pedagogic also creates open questions? Then? Yes, normally, well, the thing is that uh, uh, um, we are aiming at open questions. We're not aiming at we are using multiple choice questions only when we cannot get the participative system. Uh, right now, uh, I'm doing the first MOOC uh, of the Strasbourg University, mm -hmm. and this first MOOC is going to use France Université Numérique. I just told about you. That's mm -hmm. a French institution on MOOCs, and in France Université Numérique, they don't have this evolved evaluation scheme. So what I will have to do, I will have to give multiple choice questions for the French students of France University of America. So to, to us, we only use MCQs when we can't do open. Okay. Uh, but by default, if we, can, if we can have this system, then we will do only open questions. And we will only do MCQs if we can't. Okay. So as I said, it's not, it's not directed towards MCQs, yeah, it's directed guided towards uh, open questions. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so, where was I? Uh, yeah, two, two questions from, from the pedagogical team, and the third question is uh, a question from a student. And this is why we're also asking people to evaluate the quality of the question. But someone, somehow, a student, could come with a question that is rated as better than, than the teacher. And also, we have many subtleties. Why do we... Um, uh, how can we make people... How can we force people to make a choice? Um, as I said, we rate the questions between, we give them a rate, uh, an evaluation between 0 and 5. 5 is a very good question, 0 is a very poor question. But rather than allowing them to put 5 to all questions, because some, some non-participating students could say 5, 5, 5, and that's all. So we're a bit more tricky than that. We only give them 10 points. So they have 10 points to distribute over 3 questions, and that's problematic. Because ten is not uh, you cannot divide ten by three, 
So it means that if they, they, they cannot give 3-3-3. Three, three, three. They have to give 3-4-3 three, three, or 4-3-4. Four, four. They will have to make a choice somehow because they have an exact number of points to distribute over the three questions. Okay? So uh, somehow they will have to choose a question that is better than another. Right? Um, okay, um, and then we also have uh, an, an LO level. So Arpad LO was a physicist who was uh, playing chess and um, in, in, that was in the first half of the uh, 20th century. And at some point when you had tournaments, it would be very nice to be able to rate the level of the different, different chess players. And in order to evaluate the rate of the different chess players, what Arpadello came up with, he came up with a, a very nice function. Um, uh, and this function depends on, on the, rate, the LO rating of the two players. The LO rating of the two players is, in, is computed in, in a such way that um, the difference of points, of LO points you have, tells you what is the probability you have to win or fail against your opponent. And because it gives you the exact probability uh, to win or fail, um, the reward you will get, depending on whether you win or you fail against him, will, be, will, will depend on this probability. If you had a 50-50 probability to win or fail against the other one, then you don't get much because uh, that was, that was a, uh, an even chance for both of, the, both of you to, get, uh, to, to win. Now, if you have a 200 points difference, then it means you have 60% chance to uh, win or uh, uh, to... If, if, you're, if the other one is uh, 100, 800, 1,800 LOs and if you're 100, 600 LOs, um, six, yeah. So there are twenty. There are eighty percent chance you. F there are sixty percent chance you fail and forty percent chance you will succeed because the other one is, is better than you. So if you win against him, then you will get more points than if you had been uh, fighting against someone of the same uh, um, level as you. And as the difference between the, the, the yellow numbers of the opponents is higher then the number of ELO's points you will get if you win or lose will be greater. If you lose against someone who is really poor, then you will lose many, many points. If you win against someone who is really much better than you, then you will gain many points. And this is a very nice function because in a very, it, is, it is optimal in the sense that it will give you your true rating within, with the minimal number of, of competitions between people. Um, so the idea here was say, hey, what about using this evaluation system um, to evaluate not only the students between them, because the problem is that the students, they, they don't fight against each other, they don't evaluate each other, but what the students are doing, the students, they evaluate against exercises. So you could say that whenever they are solving an exercise, they're, they're doing a competition with the exercise, and if they fail uh, towards the exercise, then the exercise wins, so you could raise the LO number of the exercise, and, and on the contrary, if they succeed uh, with the exercise, then the exercise, uh, uh, the, the yellow number of the exercise drops and your yellow number uh, goes up. And very, very rapidly, you get an evaluation of the level of the students and you get also an evaluation of, of the difficulty of the exercise. And this is very nice because even though a, an exercise could be evaluated as difficult by the teacher, the problem with the teacher, he's got, he's, he's got so much experience, so much knowledge of many, many other things that maybe an exercise that looks very easy to him could be found very difficult for a student, you know. And on the contrary, maybe something that because, you know, it's, it has a very deep uh, knowledge in, involved in it, so the teacher would say, oh, this is a very difficult exercise, but maybe uh, for some reason the, the, the student will find it easy. So rather than trying to, to find in advance if the exercise would be difficult or not, then this is what all teachers are doing when you're doing an exam. You're rating it, you're giving us a certain number of points to different exercises, depending on what you think is the, the difficulty of the exercise will be. All right? But maybe this, this does not reflect what the student point of view will be. By doing this, you will get the, the, the difficulty of the exercise by the fact that students are succeeding or failing it. So that will be an observed uh, difficulty. And then, because the, the exercises are all the same for all students, you can also get the rates, the, the, you can evaluate the level of the students uh, between themselves through the exercises that are all the same. So, so 
because the, 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 base, the, the database of exercise is constant, uh, then you can get uh, the rating between students too. You can say if a student is better. At, at what level <coughs> does an exercise of a student come in if they haven't yet gone to any competition? Well, if they haven't, well, we we're, do, we're not exploring. We're doing exactly, exactly the same as in chess. You're starting with 1,000. Oh. That's it. We're, we're so reusing... You all this 1,000. If you don't know anything, you start. Yeah, so you start, beginners start with 1,000. But very, quite, very rapidly they raise. And, um, and so there are, then, uh, there are other systems than LO that are more refined that have come in later on, you know. And, but, but all the experience... Chess players mm, are very intellectual people. So they like things to be very refined and very exact and very perfect. So we, we totally rely on the experience for that. We know that if they had found a better way, they would have used it. So we are simply reapplying what they're, what they're using and we're quite happy with it. I wonder what would happen if you would apply the system to tennis players. Because well, the ATP, rank, ATP ranking is inspired from error. Oh. It is, a, it, is, it is an ELO ranking because, of course, because this system it works really nicely, all the rating between in competitions is based on, is based on Alpha Dello's uh, system. Can I, are you yep. connecting this with the previous uh, um, stigmergic activity? I mean, if, if uh, like a group of oh, students yes. from, from social sciences come in, they may uh, have a very different view on it. So, from... so, the way we're doing this is that whenever um, there are different questions, or whenever there are different, all the questions have an LO ranking, okay? But the courses also have, a, have an LO ranking, because if you fail all the questions of the course, then the course was too difficult for you, somehow. So, uh, and when you're facing with, uh, when you've just done a course, then you have different choices. The different choices will be towards several courses with, with, which will have different rankings. And this is a way we have to accelerate the progress of some students, or on the, on the contrary, slow down the progress of some students, depending on whether the student is bright or depending on this, whether the student has all the knowledge or whatsoever. So what we do, because we know the probability, because the different of yellow points tells us exactly the probability to succeed or not. So what we are doing is that at first we are giving, if we have enough choice, of course, within the question, and enough choice between the courses, this is why we need to have hundreds and thousands so, as to, to, so that we have the most refined uh, possibilities. If we have sufficient possibilities, we are going to give the student um, a, an exercise that will be too difficult for him, uh, with a 60% chance okay, of, of failing, and so that it is normal that he fails. But, and then, when he fails, which is something that is normal, then the next exercise we will give him on the same topic, he will have 60% chances winning, uh, succeeding on this exercise. So that in average, he will have 50% chances over the two exercises. All right? Now, this is, if he fails on the first one, then he's giving a, 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 an easier one so that he can progress, so that he does not stay on the failure. All right? But however, if the guy is bright, if the guy is bright, he will succeed directly on the first one. And if he will succeed on the first one, he will avoid doing the next one, the, the other one. And by doing this, he will be able to progress more rapidly than a student who is slightly, is not as bright as the other one. So brighter students will be proposed brighter exercises, and, and they, will be, they will have the opportunity to go through the same courses faster than other students who are slower. And then also, because the, the, rate, uh, because the student has succeeded over... Uh, um, uh, an exercise that is 60% uh, higher than him, okay, so he will gain his LO number, will grow higher, faster, and so he will also be proposed in, in return some even more difficult exercises. So the, the better you, you get, the more difficult exercises you're going to get until we find a rate at which uh, this is your maximum uh, um, gaining rate, okay, um, uh, after, uh, after a certain uh, number of error points, you, you, will, you will be facing exercises that are simply too difficult for you. And so you will be going back to your average speed of progression. But your speed of progression will be much faster if you have 2,000 errors than if you have 1,500. If you have 1,500 errors, you'll be proposed exercises that are much smoother and much easier, but more exercises too. But it affects only the exercises, not the course modules. It affects, and it is, it is recursive. All this is a complex system, so it is multi-scale, 
it is a true complex system. So because it applies, it applies also within uh, as a question in an, in a course. Then, when you offer this in the next course with the different probabilities given by the uh, uh, the pheromones on the arcs, uh, then here again the, you will be proposed uh, fer um, arcs with a uh, towards uh, exercise with a higher le uh, level. How does it interact with the pheromones? Is it is it in your personal pheromone that your L level is? In? Exactly. Your 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 personal. Um, so whenever you interact with the system, you have some cookies, okay? And this is, it is in your cookies that are stored uh, your personal pheromones that tell which exercise you've done, that tell which what is in, in your agenda that, is, that has been sent by the tutor, and what is your LO number, okay? And the way we did it is that uh, that was in Pariscope when we uh, there is Sorry, a, what? Pariscope? Pariscope is the company that has been using it. Uh, so they went from 50,000 students to 500,000 students. Yeah. And so uh, what is nice with LO is that it changes tuition into it's a gamification. Because then you present the different courses and you present the LO value of the different courses and you know your LO value. All right? And so you know that if, you're, if you want, if you're of, of sort of a challenging nature, then you will, have to, you will choose more difficult exercises because you know that if you win towards a more difficult exercise, your LO number will raise. And if you want to be the best of your class, if you want to be the, you know, the best of your classroom or whatsoever, and we have observed it with students, so students will try to get the highest uh, because they know that if they succeed, they will, they will get the, the highest uh, reward in, in LO numbers. While, rather than if they, if they go towards easier exercises, of course they will succeed, but then they will not, their, their error rate will, will not go higher. So you get some gamification here. And it is through gamification that we relate the pheromones and the yellow numbers. We present the yellow numbers there. And, and the relation is done in the head of, of the student. <laughs> I'm still trying to fully yeah. understand it. Uh, is the error number dependent on like uh, uh, mathematics and uh, yeah. uh, language? I, mean, I can understand that someone who is good at mathematics isn't good at languages. So, yeah. so they have different error numbers for the different uh, domains? So, um, when, when it was in Paris school, we had one error number. Because, uh, you know, as a student, well, they, they, they did not differentiate error numbers with, with matters. Um, uh, and so, and here to start with, we have only one level, one LO number. But somehow it reflects, if you are all more or less teachers, I don't know here, you know that really bright students, when they're really bright, they're good everywhere. <laughs> that, that happens quite often. There are, of course, some, but they, this is quite rare, who are good in only one subject and really bad in the others. But sometimes it's because they're not interested in the other subjects, you know. But, but you have, and you have students who are poor everywhere. And, but you, there are students who are good, you know, in, when I was doing my, uh, my A-levels, um, so there was one bright guy, he, he, the, we were ranked between A and E, okay, and he had A in every top, well, there was one topic in which he had a B, and the topic in which it was B was sports. But even getting a B in sports was already quite difficult, and he had A everywhere and B in sports, you know. But in, in, in Latin, of course, they were doing Latin, Greek, history, mathematics, physics, and everything. You know, A everywhere and B in sports. So there are some people like this. And so because we know that typically people can be good, can be good everywhere, so there, there was only one error rating, dependless of, of the topic. And then this is also, the poems are uh, directed towards uh, higher education. And in higher education, usually, it's, so it's not towards secondary education. In secondary education, you have your education is very diverse between history and, and, and uh, I don't know, um, um, biology and mathematics and physics and, and language and everything. But usually when you are at university, you're focusing on, on one field, which is computer science or, or, I don't know, physics or something. So, you know, when you're doing physics courses, you're not going to be having history courses at the same time. So, no, but it would be interesting to see if, like, we could, someone from biology or someone from uh, economics, uh, how they look different to the, 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 the yeah. difficulty level of a certain exercise. But right now we have only yeah. one NO number. That is interesting. But, we, but possibly we could, have, yeah. we could have different LO numbers, 
The problem then is that you would need to process the domains, and yes, that's always yeah. a problem. There is no strict separation. Yeah, strict, but but well, that, uh, Reinhardt has a PhD working on this, and 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 it is one of the topics of his PhD. He's just starting to to see how he could integrate different LO numbers, and also uh, you have seen here that in uh, in ants, real ants have different types of pheromones. They don't have only one type of pheromone. Okay, I mean one type of pheromone is a huge restriction. And, and right now, what our aim is, is to have different types of pheromones depending on the different domains, so that the domains don't mix together. And so pheromones toward literatures, well, there will be red pheromone, well, we have a color, okay, and, and um, uh, so, that, yeah, so that things don't mix and don't interact too much. But the problem also will be to, de to define different domains. But fortunately, this is already the case. You know, you know that this is a course in biology. But a course in biology can be used in computer science too. And typically, this is the case. You have ants that are being used in computer science. Yeah, but I, I would say that with the existing pheromones, the domains are already kind of split up. So people who are doing physics will not be getting recommended courses no. in the literature. So no, because if they want to the art, try them, they can. But yeah, it not be there. Exactly, the because otherwise the arts would not be there. Yeah. But if someone tries it and fails, then the art would not be rewarded correctly with the same pheromone. So, there's, well, it needs to be studied, whether the, the need is there or not. But it's a very good point. And there will be also a possibility to compare and see correlations between different competences. Exactly, yeah. Totally. So this is open, this remains open, having see how we can use different pheromones, how we can use different LO numbers for different domains. But then you would have also, it means that you, you would have three or four different LO numbers, depending on the domain. Which, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know. So, yeah? And uh, do you take into account the speed at which answers are given? No, we're not taking into account the speed at which answers are given. Um, no. Because some answers can, it's, it's normal that some answers could, could request more time than others. Oh yes, but, and, and also um, we have a way to evaluate the quality independently of what the students, part, their, their participation, we ask them, is it an interesting question or not? That is a question that we ask. So, of course, then some students could be answering anything, you know, well, they could put three or four or anything. But somehow then, if we have a question that has been created by someone, and this question, everyone answers it correctly. Is it really an interesting question? The question to which everyone answers fine is not really uh, a discriminant, okay? Then on the contrary, you have uh, uh, questions that have been created by students to which nobody can answer correctly. So maybe, there's a f maybe the, f the question is faulty. Maybe there's a problem in the question, okay? Um, so we can detect this by seeing the rate of success or, or failure to the question that is proposed. Um, and then, of course, uh, because a question... Uh, in order for a question to be a good question, it should, it should discriminate between people. Some people should fail, some people should succeed. All right? That makes it interesting. And then, uh, because we know the rating of the people who are asked the questions, normally a good question should uh, uh, be answered correctly by people who have a high LO rating. What, what would be a question that would be answered perfectly well by all the worst students and that would be failed by all the best students. It doesn't make sense. So um, we could even see whether the question would be twisted, would be a strange one, you know, because, well, the question should relate to basically the level of the other people, because the level of the other people have been made through answering the question. So the whole thing is, the whole thing is linked. It, it is coherent, okay? Um, so we have ways to detect that some, some questions are strange because they do not behave correctly. It's the same in the evaluation phase. If you evaluate things n not in a serious way, if you give any, any rating to uh, the questions you have, to the answers you have to evaluate, then normally um, uh, good students with a higher LO level should get better rates than, uh, than poor students. Uh, because this is, uh, typically the LO number is good because they've been, given, they've, been, they've been giving better answers. So we know that they are better at giving answers, right? Uh, and if constantly, whenever you're evaluating the answers of someone else, you are evaluating good people with, with you're giving bad evaluations to, to, to highly ranked people, and you're giving good evaluations to, 
to poorly ranked people, then typically your evaluation scheme is, is weird, it's strange. Maybe you're not doing it seriously. So here we can also evaluate the seriousness with which you're, you're doing your job as an evaluator. So typically, students have two, two uh, marks. They have one rating on, on how well they're doing at answering questions, okay, they, if they answered correctly or not. That's one rating on the contents of the course. And then they have a second rating on, on their participation. Do they participate well? Do they evaluate things in correlation with the yellow numbers of the, of the other people? So somehow this shows that roughly they're doing things fine. Okay. Um, and then also we have... A, a, a evaluation is very important. You know, when you're doing an exam and, and the teacher does not evaluate the exam within one month, you know, he, he just hands you back the, the marking one, one, one month after. That's not very nice for the student. Um, so there will also be a participation rating at how fast you, you evaluate the answers you're supposed to evaluate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, if uh, uh, this is, uh, all, these, uh, uh, all these questions are from the database, but uh, if three questions give the students and uh, for the same course and for the uh, same grade uh, and for the same grade students so if the uh, three questions also repeat maybe it's not good for uh, no no we make sure that the three questions process. are different so we make sure that the three questions are different <laughs> okay and then we also have a tick mark asking are two questions identical or not ah uh, yes and then uh, it's more even more refined than this uh, because there are questions that could make no sense. Because suppose the question is asked by a student, but the student did, didn't understand the course. And you understand the course much better than the student. Okay? And suddenly you're asked to be rated on a question that doesn't make any sense because the student who asked the question didn't understand the course. So he's, uh, he's asking a stupid question, really a, a, a question that is wrong. Then you should have the opportunity to say, Please, I don't want this. This question is wrong. This question is bad. So you say, this, I want another one. So you have the possibility to ask it. So you have two tick marks with each question. This question, I don't want it. Please ask me another one. But then also, then also you will see if people you know, keep clicking on this until they, can find, they find a question they can answer. Uh, we will also see this, that this, this guy keeps clicking on, you know, I want another one, I want another one. And this will, of course, the more... The more you click on, on I don't want a question, then uh, this will affect also your rating. You should accept the question that you, that you have. But all, all this in probability, and as you see, there are 1,800 uh, uh, small pedagogic items on one year. So this means that it is, it's not an evaluation on only one course. It is an evaluation on many courses. Because it's on many courses, we have the law of, of large numbers with us. So it is not because you fail at one, you know, you can, you, you, you'll be better. The, uh, all, all evaluations are only very punctual. So then it's not very important. It, it, will, it will average up. In, in, in all. So they have two tick marks, two tick box, boxes. One tick box is, I don't want this question. The question is weird, strange. And, you know, I don't want to answer this one. Um, and the other tick box is, this question is identical to one, question, one of the other questions that I've been asked. And why do we have to do this? It is because on one course, uh, of course, there will be a, an obvious question that, and everyone will be asking the same question. So we have a, a, a database of questions that have been entered by the pedagogical team. Now, the pedagogical team makes sure that all the questions are different. They start with, we are asking them 10 questions to start with. And they make sure that the 10 questions are all different. Okay. Then... Um, the, 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 the student is asked three questions. Maybe in these three questions, he says, oh, this one is identical to another one. If we see that uh, he sticks on, the thing that on, the, on one question saying that it is identical to one of the others, then of course we know that either he ticked on a question from, the stu from a student or he ticked on a question from the teacher. Okay. If he ticked on a question from the teacher, then it is the question on, from the student that is identical to the question on the, on the teacher. So we know that the question of the student is identical to the other one. All right. Or 
if he ticks on the question of the student, we know that he ticked on this question. So whether he ticks, we, there can only be one question that is identical to another. Because two of the questions come from the set of the teachers, and with set of the teachers we know have no identical questions. So the one, say one is identical to the other, we know that, the, that one, it, is one, it is the question of the student who is identical to the other. Then the student will be given a second question to answer. Because, why is it important to know that a question is identical to another one? Because all this is participative. Because it is participative, the, the teacher only gives 10 questions with his course. Uh, but uh, the idea is that when there is a very nice question that has been asked by a student, everyone thinks this question is great and it, is good, it is, has a good discrimination rate, it does its job nicely. When there's a, huge, a great question like this, it will be shown to the pedagogical team. And, the, ped and it will, the pedagogical team say, look, this is a question, everyone said it was nice, it discriminated nicely and so, it could be a nice question to add to the database of validated questions. Okay? And then, if the, if the question is different from the others, but we know it will be different, because if it has been identical, then people have said it's identical. The idea is that because we're planning to have 100,000 students, we cannot have 100,000 questions come back to the, to the pedagogical team. We need to find out the very best question. And the very best questions will be submitted to the pedagogical team, and if they like it, they said, okay, that's an interesting new question, and they will put an 11th question in the database, and they will provide their own answer to it. And so this is how, participatively, the, the, the archive of good questions will, will grow up. So we need to have some quality, some identity, so some uh, knowledge on how good the questions are, because they will add up. Uh, one technical question, if a student is supposed to evaluate an answer, does he get the official answer to compare with the answer yes. of the student? Yes. Uh -huh. so, so it does not assume that he knows the answer himself? No. He gets the one that... Yeah. Yes, he will get it, but after only. And then he can compare whether he did yeah. right or not, yeah. that, which is nice too. But he will not be shown the answer given by the student, because possibly the answer given by the student will not be a good answer. So the answer given by the student to the question he has created will be given to the team, to the pedagogical team, while as a hint, on what the student had thought. And it's nice for the student to explain why, uh, what uh, the answer to his question was. You know, it makes, him, it, makes it uh, uh, more clear for him that his question should be of good quality. Because, of course, you could have a, question, you know, a nice question to ask on this uh, uh, seminar here, and this presentation is, what is the background color of the slides? That's a question. <laughs> it's not very interesting, but everyone will get it right, and so somehow we will detect that it's a poor question because everyone gets it right, and probably people will say it's not an interesting question. So the idea is, is, to, is, is that good questions come up, and so that we can pick them up. So Ooh. the idea is that at the end you have a, a, a set of standard validated questions. Yes. That All has the been... others are merely there as candidate questions. Exactly. They and they, really... and they have been provided for by the students. The, the students have, have accrued, have added some new questions. And then, uh, but now I see that I've been talking for a long time. It's already more, more than one. Um, uh, because of the uh, artificial and uh, system, the, the manual system that we have inside. So, let me go through more slides. Uh, we're doing crowdsourcing for new contents. Um, at the end of a course, if we have a student who has an LO number of 2000, 2000, if we refer to the chess community, 2000 is a good regional, regional level. Okay? It's not national level, national level would be 2300. Okay, but 2,000 is a good regional. 2,000 is a very good level in chess. So if you have a student who ends up with 2,000, we are off, this is also in gamification, in gamification, we, it opens him the right to create his new course. And we say, along the different curriculum that you have, is there a course that you think you could do better than the teacher? Um, and if it says, yes, this one I think the teacher didn't explain it well, maybe I have an another example to give, maybe I can explain it better to my 
co-students because, of course, the teacher uses words that are different. He uses uh, references that the students don't have and everything. You would get the slides. <laughs> um, and so um, uh, when the student is good, he's offered to create a new content. Then he's got, a web, he's got a webcam on his computer, he's got a girlfriend, he's got, you know, PowerPoint, he can do whatever he likes. Please do replace the course that you have seen. And for each course, we, we indicate what are the, um, uh, the contents of the course, what is this content about. So we know what the contents the course should address. So the student tries to do the course addressing the same content. Then, when he has done it, because he had 2,000 elo points, so we know he's not a guy who is totally stupid, we include this, this course into the anthill. And because it's included into the anthill, when students get there, they can either choose the course from the teacher or the course from the student. And here, but of course he will not know that the course is from the student. Well, he will see the guys different. But. <laughs> After a while, if it's diverse enough, we have many, many different people in uh, who will give you the course. Where we will see that the course is efficient or not is afterwards. If the people who went through the student course do better later on, if they have more success later on, the, the, the pheromones will, be, will have a higher rate through the student course. On the contrary, if the people who go through the student course fare worse later on, if they do worse later on, then the pheromones will be worse on the student path and will be better on the, on the teacher's path. So uh, the pheromone will mean that uh, his course will disappear or will not be used yeah, anymore. On the happen in practice? In practice, it, it did happen. So that was very nice to, uh, to see that some students came up. That was done in, in class school. That, uh, uh, we had done an experiment. So we had asked students to explain it was on derivatives. Okay. And then uh, a student course came up better. Because, and not better because it was liked by the people, but came up better because later on we could see more success from people who went through this course than from people who went through the course of, of the teacher. Because somehow the student managed to, to convey, you don't need to be a Nobel Prize, you know, you, you to pedagogic skill, it's, you have a Nobel Prize, can have poor, terribly poor pedagogic skill, and we get a whole room to, to get to sleep in five minutes, you know. <laughs> That's very, very easy. Um, so the, we are doing we are doing crowdsourcing for new contents. First of all, to replace co existing courses, and because of the Menhill paradigm, good courses will get promoted. And after a while, you can replace uh, the course from a teacher. Uh, and then also above, let's say, 2,500 LO. 2,500 is a national level; is a uh, great master level. Okay, the guy is really bright. And there are really bright guys. There is Einstein, you know, who was a student at some point, and he has some really nice ideas. And then, of course, you have many uh, examples. Taylor Wilson, he got a position at Reno University at 18, okay, because he did a, a nuclear fusion reactor when he was 16. And well, the guy is really bright, you know. And some, and they could have good ideas, even though they are your students. And they could have, they could out, uh, outbrain you. They could be much better than you. And these people who show that they are good everywhere, that get great ratings, well, we're offering them the opportunity to do a course on something else they want. And when they do a course on something else they want, this course will be evaluated by people who are specialists on the domain, by, by a committee, a pedagogic committee. But here we're allowing people to create new contents. And the contents will be selected or not selected by usage uh, from the students. So here we're doing yeah, crowdsourcing. I think I should stop here because, of course, I've got maybe on the slide, but... Uh... Oh, yes, and then we have open badges. So we are doing uh, um, evaluation. When you have evaluated a series of courses in the same domain, then we think that you have gained the right to say that, okay, you have validated, you have gained some knowledge in this domain. So we deliver an open badge. Uh, you might have heard of uh, Mozilla open badges. No. Um, so Mozilla started it. It's, it's a uh, uh, institution that does that that um, uh, delivers some uh, registered badges. You cannot. You have to to be. Uh, uh, you cannot get the badge from someone else. So they make sure that they are secure, that they are yours, and they can be obtained only through the uh, the course that you went through. So they are certificated badges. Kind of like a green or certificate. 
Yes, but it's not delivered by by universities. It's just delivered by by the um, uh, teaching institution who delivers the badge. So, for instance, the the course on uh, artificial evolution that will be done through FUN, uh, the French university, the new, new American university, uh, it will not be a grade from university, so we will deliver open badges. So, okay, you have you have had a reasonable, so we have we have an open badge with three stars, two stars, one star. And to say that, of course, depending on how well you succeeded. And then students, they have e-portfolios. Right now there's an e-portfolio which is called Mahara, and it's a portfolio that is associated to you, and you can store all your badges that you gain from different uh, uh, courses. And then you can put the portfolio into, into your CV. Into your CV, you can say, I got this badge from on, I don't know, artificial evolution, I got this badge, on thing. And then, depending on who delivered the badge, uh, the employer gives credit or not to the badge. If it's a badge delivered by University of Strasbourg or another university, maybe it will have different quality. Um, and this is very nice, too, because it allows to create, this is very important, it allows to create specific curricula for companies, too. You know that companies now, people, it's very rare to have people who are doing the same job during the whole career. Sometimes they get fired and they have to find a new job into a new direction. So now lifelong tuition is something that is very important and people sh should uh, upgrade their, their knowledge and so as to adapt and get to, to know new, new uh, skills. And so what happens is that periodically companies have to train their own people, their own uh, engineers, to new uh, techniques or such. And uh, what we are offering, and this is working, uh, so we are offering this for companies uh, who want to improve their own um, employer, employees, but also to, stu to students who want to have an interview with a company to, to, get, uh, to get a job. Now some companies need Engineers in computer science, right now it's, it's very much the case in France, uh, but in computer science you have databases, you have web uh, uh, programming, then you have uh, systems, then you have many different domains uh, in computer science. And so perhaps Abaz, which is a company in Strasbourg, want, they, want to recruit, they want to get an engineer in systems. So what we're doing with Abaz is that um, we are creating with Abaz um, a pedagogic item which will be an evaluation item. It will only contain some evaluations. And if the, uh, the guy who is doing this item validates all the evaluation correctly, we are making sure with Abaz that Abaz wants to, to, to get this guy. So we are putting this uh, evaluation item into the manhill. And people who want to do this, they will want to validate it. If they, if they go and validate it directly, well, they will fail. If they go and do it directly, they will fail because they will not have the correct knowledge. And if, if Abbas is a very uh, good company and everyone wants to get a job from Abbas, what, what will happen, a, a, a path will create between uh, people who are starting there and Abbas directly. And this path will be optimal. It will contain the very smallest number of courses you have to attend to be able to validate the ABAS uh, evaluation machine. So for them it is very valuable because it makes a, um, an a la carte uh, uh, tuition scheme for the skills they want. Okay? And what we give as a reward, whoever validates the ABAS evaluation will get an interview with ABAS. So, first of all, what we're doing is that we make Abbas pay to elaborate the, uh, the questions, the evaluation, the evaluation item. So, they're paying right now, it is 1,000 euros for them to be creating one of these evaluation things. And it makes them visible into the uh, tuition scheme. So, that's nice because it's good publicity for them. And then, whenever someone validates the thing, he, he, has he has validated it because he gained some skills along by using some courses here. So it is normal that uh, the courses be rewarded because the guy used the courses to validate Abbas. 
So whenever someone validates the ABAS uh, thing, ABAS gives 100 euros to, to the university because the student has used the, the, the courses that were developed by the university. Then ABAS gets the email address of the other one and, and the student gets automatically an interview with the company to, to see whether he can do the job or not. So this is a nice way to make a relationship between the industry and the university uh, and to create some specific uh, uh, curricula for a particular company. That's going to be different from the general curriculum you get at the university. I think it should stop there.